Here we are. Welcome to Chapter 12. We're going to be looking at property crime and fraud. Um, so when trying to understand property crime, I think it's pretty common sense that, you know, the main um, motive behind this crime is either for, you know, financial status or to gain stuff or whatever it is. So, um, you know, in creating an understanding, we can say that the poor might do so because they don't have access to this. Um, but that doesn't explain everything because we know that um, high income individuals will also commit fraud or theft or whatever. And so, um, you know, usually a good explanation in trying to understand why higher income people will commit property crime or fraud is just simply greed, which we know, you know, happens. So the FBI reports that we have about $15 billion worth of things or um, fraudulent claims a year. Um, and so uh, these are the types of crimes that you are likely to be victimized by sometime in your life. Um, most of you will have something stolen, something ripped off. And so today we're going to be talking about the different types of property crime and fraud. Because um, what you'll find is that, you know, the offender can take the exact same object, but the way in which they do it really determines, you know, the type of crime that um, we're dealing with. So let's go through our chapter objectives. So chapter objectives for chapter 12, we want to be able to define the various property crimes discussed in the text, including burglary, larceny theft, motor vehicle theft, arson, forgery, counterfeiting, and then fraud, which we might be buying, receiving, and possessing stolen property and or embezzlements. We want to become familiar with the extent of property crime be acquainted with the patterning of property crime, including geographic and demographic differences. We want to understand the social organization of property crime, including the different types of burglars, the significance of tipsters and fences, and decision-making involving burglary. We want to be familiar with the costs and circumstances surrounding property crime and victimization. We want to understand the various explanations for property crime, including the implications of cultural emphasis on economic success, techniques of neutralization, economic deprivation and unemployment, routine activities and social process factors, property crime for thrills, and shoplifting. We want to be familiar with the various suggestions that have been advanced for reducing property crime, including target hardening and community prevention. We want to be acquainted with the different types of fraud, including identity theft, tax fraud, insurance fraud, computer fraud, and computer crime. Lastly, we want to understand the costs of fraud. All right, so here we are. We're going to start talking about the different types of property crime. And most of these terms are probably relatively familiar to you, and you probably, you know, many of you have a decent understanding of each of them. Um, so the first one that we're going to talk about is burglary. During a burglary, you have the unlawful entry of a structure to commit a felony or threat. Um, the big difference, sometimes people get robbery and burglary confused, but as you learned in your last chapter on violent crime, um, with robbery, you have to have force or the threat of force. So with burglary, you're having more of an unlawful entry. So someone enters your house um, through an open window or, um, you know, comes in, breaks in, um, your, breaks down your door or something like that. Um, I think sometimes the reason it gets confused is because you can have home invasion robbery. Um, I want you to think of burglary, though, as more kind of secretive, right? Um, these people just want your stuff. They don't necessarily want the confrontation. A home invasion robbery is a little different, right? You, you are going to have that threat of violence. Um, maybe someone is pointing a gun at you, telling you, you know, to get all the cash in your house or something like that. Think of burglary as being a little more secretive. Um, and again, they don't want to confront you. You know, um, you are a great deterrent. If, if you want to keep people out of your house, um, staying home is one of the biggest things. Um, burglary doesn't fit into some of the other crimes in that it's actually much more likely to happen during the day. Um, so I know in my neighborhood, just in the last couple months, there were a few burglaries, um, even two houses down. Um, one of our neighbors had a bunch of guns stolen. Kind of scary in that respect. Um, but again, this guy came home from work one day and, oh, wow, things look fishy. 
um, then he notices all the stuff is gone. And so um, burglary, the unlawful entry of a structure to commit that theft or, or even felony. All right, so the next one we'll look at is larceny theft. And you are familiar with this, even though you probably don't, maybe not have used the word larceny, but larceny is the attempted or completed unlawful taking, carrying, leading, or riding away of property from one another. Um, you're like, what the heck does that mean? Well, um, something like shoplifting, right, would be considered larceny. Um, another example would be pickpocketing, someone, you know, taking something off of your purse or your person, um, someone snatching your purse, um, even something like bike theft. And the main difference with larceny and burglary is with larceny, generally the dynamics are that you have invited this person into your home or the property is like somewhat out in the public. Um, so, for instance, um, let's do an example of burglary. Burglary, you come home one day, your jewelry box is raided. People have taken it, it's gone, right? Larceny um, would be a little bit different in that, let's say you had a party and um, you noticed that after the party that someone had gone into maybe your parents' bedroom and they had taken the jewelry box. So the main difference between larceny and burglary is that with larceny, that person was invited in the home. Now you can also have things like, so you know, think about shoplifting, the person is invited into the establishment. Um, now with other types of larceny, for instance, um, for instance, if you are, um, you notice that you come home one day and I don't know, your garden gnome has been stolen out of your garden, um, that would be larceny because there was no um, uh, unlawful entry. Essentially, you know, um, it is your private property, but, you know, people, maybe just someone walking by noticed or something like that. And so that's kind of the, the main difference is that either it's out in the open, like your bike is locked up or something like that. Um, your, you know, whatever you have in your front yard, um, or, you know, someone actually had to break in to um, get that. So, the next one we'll look at is motor vehicle theft. And motor vehicle theft, um, it's kind of in the name, you know, people stealing cars and trucks and things like that. Um, in another class this week, one of my students said, oh, people who drive like luxury um, vehicles are most likely to get, you know, have their car stolen. But actually, it's not the case. Um, I think the most um, the most prevalent car stolen is a Honda Accord, and they don't even care if they're old or, or whatever. Generally, what happens with motor vehicle theft too um, is that they you know they take these cars to chop shops and, and they sell them out. They sell them piece by piece, um, and you know that's how they make their money because it's hard to sell a car you know without a pink slip. So um, also really common are SUVs and minivans. Um, we also, uh, there was a kind of a trend that was happening a few years ago where people were stealing tailgates off trucks, right? So this would be a form of larceny, I believe. Um, but, you know, and, and then what was happening, it was really interesting, and this relates to what we'll talk about in a few minutes about the, the enterprise behind this, is that a lot of the times they were, you know, either taking these, the back of the tailgate or the third row of a car or something like that, and then they'd go on eBay, or not eBay, on Craigslist, and probably sell them back to the people who were, um, you know, who had this crime against them. So kind of an interesting um, kind of logic going on there. Next, we'll look at arson. So arson slightly different. Arson is obviously um, any willful or malicious burning or attempt to burn. Um, so, I mean, this can happen for a lot of reasons. Um, if you remember that, that group TLC, um, one of the members of TLC got really mad with her lover or her spouse, and she threw all of his his clothes and stuff in a bathtub and lit it on fire. Um, the fire got out of control and she ended up burning down a, you know, a million dollar house or something like that. Um, and so, you know, arson, you can just be trying to be a jerk and whatever, or, um, oftentimes there's fraud associated with arson as well. So, um, you know, there are cases where people will burn down their cars and try to claim insurance money. Um, during the Great Recession, I remember hearing parole agents talking about um, how there were people who were burning down their homes because uh, they were so underwater, meaning they owed more than the house was worth, that um, it would have made sense because they would have gotten, you know, what they paid for in their insurance money. Um, so fraud is another kind of element to that. Um, also really interesting with arson is 
there's um, an attraction um, with young people. So especially young boys, but young girls are also attracted to fire. Um, and um, a lot of the um, people who are committing these, you know, they'll, they'll be playing around with fire or something like that, and it will get out of control. And so we've seen that numerous times as well. Um, there was also some interesting research that, um, and you know, this is a very, very small kind of sliver of arson, but um, there are firefighters who are actually really attracted to arson, and it makes sense because they understand kind of the, um, the techniques for starting fires. Um, and so there were like, and this is just a few, like I said, but there were a few like rogue firefighters who were going off and setting fires, um, later they found, you know, and they were really good at it because they totally understand how to do this. So just kind of an interesting tidbit, but that's not common at all. So don't think, don't accuse your firemen of starting fires. The next one we'll look at is forgery or counter forgery. Your book's de definition is making, altering, um, or possessing with the intent to defraud anything false in the semblance of that which is true. Um, so you're like, what the heck is that? Um, so forgery or counterfeiting could be anything. Um, you are trying to pass something off as if it was true. Um, so you can um, obviously, if you are making fake checks, writing writing those checks out, um, that would be forgery um, and counterfeiting or counterfeit checks, right? And then you're forging the um, signature, so it's kind of um, attached to those ideas. Um, there's counterfeit everything, right? So um, a few years ago when, you know, all those purses, people were spending $500 on Dunia Burke purses or Coach purses, obviously, you know, there's a, someone out there who was creating um, false ones, right, and selling them as if they were true. Um, again, this can, this can pretty much be anything. I've seen it with sunglasses. You've seen it with I mean, just anything. Um, people will make fake, you know, um, concert tickets, anything. Um, and then people get there and realize that they don't work. Um, and so just anytime you're really trying to deceive people, that's definitely, and it's a, it's a form of fraud. So we'll talk about fraud as our next kind of, um, so fraud is a kind of an umbrella term. And fraud is obtaining money or property with a false pretense. Right, so you'll notice a lot of these types of property crime are tied together. So, like I mentioned, if you burn down your car for the insurance money, not only is that arson, but it's also fraud. So you would be charged with two different crimes. Um, that's you know true for um, you know type, certain types of white collar crime as well. So if you're obtaining money or property under the false pre under any false pretense, um, you are committing fraud. Um, there was, just to give you some examples, there were people, I think it was at Target, and they would um, they would buy, like when iPads first came out, they would buy these iPads and then return them. Um, and they had like these special sealers where they could make it look like they were never opened. And so they would take the iPods out and um, put in something that would give it, you know, the same type of weight, seal it back up and then go return it to Target. And then, of course, um, it would fall on the person who bought it next because Target wouldn't have opened it to find it out. Um, so that would be fraudulent. Um, we also know sometimes people will do weird things with like receipts and try to return things that they didn't buy. Like so they'll steal the item, find a receipt that has that item on there and then try to get cash, which is why you know, I'm a big Target person. Um, Target has like, you know, some rules about that. You can only return things so often without a, the receipt and stuff like that. And that's pretty much for that reason because they got pretty screwed doing that. Another type of property crime is buying, receiving, or possessing stolen goods. Um, and so this really ties into the whole network that's going on. Um, you know, something like even like art theft, which is you know, relatively rare. Um, but, you know, think about someone stealing a million dollar piece of art. It's, it's only worth something if you know someone who's going to buy it or if you want it, you know, just for your own personal collection. And so um, if you are somewhere in this like line where you're, you're also buying that particular piece or whatever, that is considered a crime as well. Um, and sometimes people don't realize this, right? And they're like, well, I was just, I just bought this, you know, this iPod out of the back of someone's truck or something like that. Um, but that is also fraudulent if, if you know at least that, you know, the way that this got to you was um, through theft or something like that. Um, so we'll talk about the whole kind of the connection and the enterprise that's associated with this in a minute. 
Lastly, you have embezzlement, and embezzlement is the misappropriation of funds entrusted to one's case, um, care, or custody. Um, and so, you know, uh, you can embezzle money on a extremely large scale. It can be a really small scale as well. Um, this is kind of embarrassing now, but I had this boyfriend in high school whose father was the mayor of San Dimas. You can probably Google it and find it. And um, he was um, embezzling money from the Meals on Wheels program. His father was. Um, I don't think he ended up getting in too much trouble because I know he's got another business now and very successful, but that kind of goes again with the, the class of the individual. Um, but you know, um, that money was supposed to be appropriated for that particular program, and he was taking it home, filling up his home pockets. This kind of stuff is not uncommon. Um, but even on a small scale, you know, if you start somehow figuring out a way to, you know, slant the, t the, um, the till at your work. Um, I remember I knew one girl who was, she worked for a particular company and she was like returning things herself as an employee saying other people were doing it because no one was there watching her and then taking the funds so she would just take something off the um the rack you know do a uh, return and of course take the money and so that's a form of embezzlement too um so people embezzle millions of dollars people embezzle you know next to nothing um, but anytime you have that misappropriation of funds when you have been entrusted, so people have put their trust in you to do the right thing, um, that is considered embezzlement. So. All right, so let's do some breakdown of how common these particular um, crimes are. So, of course, um, burglary. Um, according to UCR, Uniform Crime Report, um, you have about 2 million um, burglars a year. Of course, a uh, National Crime Victimization Survey is going to be a lot more accurate um, because not everyone reports their burglaries. And I will um, attest to that. Years and years ago when I was a college student, um, someone burglarized our home. And um, it really sucked for me. I was waiting tables at the time, and it was around Christmas, so I was just working my butt off. And I just randomly happened to have like $800 in my room, just hadn't gone to the bank, just again, just working, working, working. And um, I realized, oh, well, you know, um, all that money's gone. And then my roommates noticed, oh, my gosh, my, you know, tablet's gone or whatever it was. We didn't have tablets back then. But um, I noticed I had a digital camera gone. And so I'm not actually sure if that was burglary or larceny. A bit of me suspects that it might have been someone we knew, um, you know, but who knows, they also tried to kick down a door in the house that was locked. Um, so, you know, anyways. Um, but no, it would, still would have been burglary because that person would have been invited in. Um, but oftentimes, that's, a, that's kind of a good example anyway, because a lot of the times, they are people you know. they are people who are watching out, looking at your house. Again, they don't want you to be home. Um, there are people who scope out your house. They know, you know, oh, these people get up, they leave. You know, most people's patterns are pretty consistent. You go to work at 8, you come home at 5, whatever it is, you're gone for most of the day. Um, and again, like I said, most people will be burglarized sometime in their, their life. Um, it has declined steadily since the 1970s. But about the, the number your book gives is about 72% of burglarized or people would be burglarized at least once. Um, some of the reason for the decline, you know, we have more alarms. Um, people stay home more because of, you know, cable and video games and computers and the Internet. I mean, keep in mind that there was a time where you only got, you know, four or five channels on your TV. So getting outside might have been more incentivized. Um, of course, too, we have we don't carry cash around like we used to, which is why things like purse snatching and um, pickpocketing probably aren't as popular either because, you know, um, you can um, cancel that credit card pretty easily. Um, and only about 16 to 17 percent of people um, of these burglaries are ended up uh, getting cleared on arrest. I remember uh, my parents telling me that they were they lived in Lakewood, California, and they were burglarized. I think before I was born, um, but they thought they was fought, it was horrible. They ended up finding my mother's purse in a neighbor's yard. So they had taken the wallet or whatever and just dumped it. Um, but one interesting kind of aspect to it, and this wasn't, you know, it's kind of creepy, but um, they ended up taking my dad's jeans, which were like on the floor, you know, next to them or something like that. And you might go, well, why would they want a pair of jeans? 
Well, because, you know, if they were to get caught, the jeans would be the first thing that a person would do, right? Put your clothes on. They don't know my father. I think he would have run out anyway. But um, just kind of a kind of an interesting dynamic going on there. Um, so what else here? Um, most of the arrests with burglary and um, motor vehicle theft are um, males. Um, we see higher rates of um, females offending when it comes to things like larceny. Women are very good at shoplifting. <laughs> it's, it's kind of like our crime. Um, so it's interesting because men do shoplift, um, but 56% of larceny cases are females. Um, females are more likely to shoplift smaller items, um, you know, makeup or things that don't really cost a lot. Um, unfortunately, I was a shoplifter, as don't tell anyone, but um, I was stealing makeup, I think, in like junior high or something like that. Don't worry, we got caught and I learned my lesson. Um, anyways, but um, females are much more likely to shoplift. When males shoplift, they go for um, higher or more expensive items. Typically, um, your offenders in all of these cases are white, um, poor, and young. So again, these are more of like those young person crimes. And I, I guess I got a little bit ahead of myself with this one because I kind of went over a lot of this. But um, uh, when, when in regards to geography, um, burglary, larceny, and all property crimes are highest in large cities. Again, you have that population density. Um, you know, even with that, you think you see people with things, right? You, If you live in an apartment, it's going to be a lot harder to hide that big screen TV that you just bought or that computer that you just bought. Um, and so it is higher in large cities in regards to age, more of a young person's crime. Again, here in the picture, they have um, motor vehicle theft. It's not that it doesn't happen. Actually, at the new school that I'm working at, Green River um, in Auburn, Washington, we've had quite a few um, uh, motor vehicle thefts. It's a little surprising to me. Um, and again, they're like the Honda Accords and stuff like that. It's like a 1993 and you think, geez, what, what the heck would you, what do you even want with this car? But again, you know, those are very popular cars. And so for parts, you can probably, you know, get rid of them pretty quickly because other people have them. And then again, gender here, um, it's much more likely to be um, uh, done by males except for um, larceny, which is about 56% of females. So I always thought this was really interesting and kind of understanding that there's a whole level of organization that goes on when it comes to property crime and people are playing different roles. Um, so property criminals are r really good at like social networking, not, not necessarily online. Maybe actually, I take that back, actually, it's probably good. Um, so ways in which they can support their criminal ways. Um, there was a really interesting 60-minute um, segment um, a couple years ago where they talked about Medicare fraud. And so what these people were doing was they were setting up um, like fake, fake doctor's office, essentially. It was just like a, a storefront. And they would get a doctor to sign on as, you know, the, the person that was serving that particular facility. And um, they would bill Medicare, if you don't know, yeah, Medicare. If you don't know Medicare, that's our government-subsidized um um, health care for senior citizens and of course Medicare has to pay out really quickly it's like part of the law and so they would bill you know you guys know how expensive um, health care is they would bill for millions and millions of dollars and Medicare would have to pay you know within 60 days or something like that and then what they would do is they would like collect millions of dollars um, and then um, like close shop um, the interesting part of this that I remember from the segment was that it really was re reflective of this whole enterprise. So you would you would go online and there would be someone on there who was a criminal, right? This is against the law, who's selling um, uh, like social security numbers and, and people's names attached to that. So you actually had, you know, something 
um, you know, the actual um, content, right? That you, here's, you know, Miss Mary Jones and, you know, this is her social security number, this is her Medicare number. Um, but it was this like whole line of criminals kind of working together. You'd buy those names and then, you know, anyways. So you had this whole enterprise and networks really supporting each other. Um, and, but it really depends if you look on the different range um, ranges. Um, you have low levels. These are people who are generally young. They're amateur. They're opportunistic, meaning they're just kind of doing it when the opportunity arises. You don't get a lot of skill with these people. Um, they're not really looking for a lot of gain, or they don't really get a lot of gain. Um, and again, you know, really spend little time in the residence. Um, another time, our family members had a vacation house that was burglarized, and the um, the burglar stole. Uh, beer and a Nintendo and all the games and so you know you don't have to be a brain scientist to realize that these were low-level burglars um, they didn't really get a lot of stuff um, it's probably really dumb right to think about you know breaking into a home for beer and uh, a Nintendo but of course it was a vacation home so when we think about lifestyles and routine activities theory right in this house no one's ever here the next one, um, these are middle range um, burglars, and these people spend more time looking for attractive targets. Um, they're more la act, they're much more likely to act alone than your low level or your high level. Um, they are better though at the low level. They're they're good at defeating things like burglary systems, um, and they spend more time you know planning and things like that. Then your high level burglars. I want you guys to think of these people as professionals. Right, they're very, very skilled. They know what they're doing. And remember, when it comes to like criminality, you know, a lot of these people become so skilled in it in the same way that you become skilled at a job, right? Like, so um, you practice at it, you study, um, you know. And it, I just, you know, and that's why they're called career criminals. But they're, you know, some of them are very, very good. They're really good at defeating. Um, you know, home home security systems, and they spend a lot of time planning. They might even consider traveling. Um, I, I really did dislike this person in popular culture, but you probably noticed that Kim Kardashian was burglarized not too long ago. Um, I would suggest that that was most likely a high-level burglar, right, that they were scoping her out. And again, you know, she posts all this stuff on social media, of all these things that she has. And I mean, they, they stole them. I think it was over a million dollars. So, I mean, significant, right? But again, good luck trying to get rid of it. You're going to have to sell it to someone who, you know, is okay buying stolen property. So here we're going to talk about that kind of criminal um, social kind of network that's happening here. Um, and these think of, you know, think, think of this as like support, a support system for the burglars. What are you going to do once you get this? So you have tipsters. Um, tipsters are people who give burglars um, information, right? So maybe you work at an establishment, you know, your friend is up to this kind of thing and you give him the blueprints of what, you know, what the house looks like or what the business looks like. Um, so, you know, you can go in this door, go out this door, the alarm won't go off or won't, will go off or whatever. And so uh, maybe that person might um, get something financially out of this just for providing the information. Um, then you have the fences and fences are people who sell the stolen goods. So um, in, in some cases you might have, sorry, I should have put these out. Um, you might have um, received stolen property at some time. Um, and so, you know, the fences are really kind of the middleman, right? They're the people who are working in the shadows of two worlds, right? So they're dealing with the criminals, but they're also selling this, this stuff out into, um, into the world. Um, oftentimes, you know, people will try to get rid of their stuff with um, pawn shops. Pawn shops are not allowed to buy anything that they think is stolen. And I think they have, um, there's like a clause where, you know, if something stolen turns up in a pawn shop, the pawn shop actually has to get it back. Um, and so, you know, that was one strategy for a while, but the law kind of caught up with, you know, people who were doing that. And of course, again, just like we talked about the low, middle, and high range burglars, um, the same is true for the, for the fences and the tipsters. There's, there are amateurs, there are people who are really good at this. Um, people that are not so good. I would suspect too, with the advent of the internet, this has really helped people get rid of things. Um, you can sell anything on Craigslist now. Um, and yeah.
All right, so here we're gonna look at like some of the decision-making process, right? And so we're gonna look at like why people choose or decide on who to burglarize. Um, and so there are all different types of strategies people employ. Um, for instance, most burglaries will happen, you know, will be within the confines of where that person lives, where the burglar lives, right? Um, just kind of common sense, right? They can, they want to get in and get out easy. Um, you know, you don't want to have to drive two hours home after something like this. Get in, get out, done. Um, and again, that person would have knowledge of the areas. Um, you know, they'll know the neighborhoods, they'll know the houses that are unoccupied. I mean, you probably know the houses that are unoccupied in your neighborhoods if you do enough walking or something like that. Um, we do know, though, that they are likely to also go to very rich areas because rich people have nice stuff. Shouldn't be surprising to you. Um, also, you know, um, uh, picking homes that are less visible to maybe neighbors. Um, that would be kind of another strategy that people employ. Um, even for a long time, I know these aren't as popular, but people would look at the obituaries, and these are like the announcements of when people die, um, because, you know, that tells you a lot of information. This person just died, their husband, their spouse was already dead. Um, it's quite likely that that house is completely empty at this point. Also, you know, the um, things like electronics are a lot smaller than they used to be. Um, I know some of you are like 18, 19, but think about those those huge t tube TVs. We had one up until not too long ago where it was like, good luck trying to steal this thing. I mean, every time we moved, it was so awkward and clumsy. Um, so I wish someone would have taken it at some point. But, um, you know, and when you compare that to my new flat screen, it's, um, you know, it's a lot more easy to take something like that, a laptop versus a desktop. Um, an iPod versus an old school CD player. I mean, geez, that's super easy. You can put that in your pocket. So as electronics have gotten lighter and, and smaller, you know, we have seen, you know, they're easier to steal. All right, so just some of this is a little repetitive, but um, you, you have these three elements. So you have knowledge of occupants, um, so, for instance, we know these people leave for work at this time and come home at this time. You receive a tip, maybe um, the neighbors tell you, you know, they're gone on vacation or someone you know tells you, um, and then also people observing. So, again, most burglaries are actually happening during the day, um, and only in about 25% of the time are people actually home. Um, and again, a lot, half of people don't report these to the police. Um, part of that is sometimes they feel responsible. I know when I was younger, um, we got burglarized at one time. We were college students. Um, in some ways, I thought, gosh, maybe this is someone we knew or we let a lot of people into our house. We had a lot of parties and friends over and things like that. And so, um, I don't know. In some ways, I think we kind of thought it was our own fault. Um, but it wasn't. But it's important that you report because, you know, generally what happens is like certain groups are hitting up neighborhood, like house after house after house. And so, you know, if the police start to receive, you know, notice that there's a pattern going on, maybe they will, might start targeting your area um, in trying to, you know, keep the stuff from happening. So now we'll kind of discuss some of the costs and consequences of property crime. Um, so obviously there's an economic cost. Um, victims lose property, they lose money, they whatever it is. Um, and that's about $4.4 billion annually. Um, and most burglaries are residential, about 2,100 are, are residential. So, um, but there's also a psychological impact, right? The idea of knowing that someone is in your house is, you know, and that's financial, intangible, but psychological, right? Like, it's creepy. Even when my car got broken into a couple times, it's just like, ooh, like, there was someone in here. Um, and, you know, females are more likely to be upset, I think, because of um, kind of victimization, rape, sexual assault. Um, and, you know, the psychological is, is important because, you know, there are people who, you know, can't sleep at night because they're afraid of this happening or, um, you know, maybe have PTSD if it was that bad. Um, and so, you know, um, I think a lot of the psychological, just even from reading a lot of your, um, those of you who have done the interview assignment interviewing victims of crime, 
I think that was a great assignment because I think it really helped you see that the, the psychological, you know, money's money and money comes and money goes, but geez, your peace of mind is worth a lot too, right? So um, just kind of going a little bit um, deeper here. We also have motor vehicle theft, right? And so obviously, you know, billions annually in loss that way financially. Motor vehicle theft is most likely to happen at night and on average, it's about $7,000 per vehicle. Um, just kind of getting a larger scope. If you look at arson, arson um, ends up costing about $17,000. So very, very expensive, um, mostly buildings. Um, and again, like I said, sometimes it is cars and things like that. Just recently, um, there was a house. Sounds like I live in a horrible area. I don't though. But um, Washington is just a little different than California. I can't, more rural and stuff like that. But there was a house that had burned down. All of a sudden, the same route I drive to school every day, there's the house is just gone. It's just burnt. And then a couple days later, a big sign in front with arson. And I'm like, whoa, 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 right? And obviously, you know, someone might commit arson to try to kill someone. Um, but obviously, you would have homicide attached to their crime. But it's still arson as well. So... You know, the dynamics vary, but they're there. So um, next we're going to talk about why this stuff happens. So why does it happen? Um, we can look at things like economic deprivation, people who don't aren't kind of included in the main economy. So they create economies for themselves and oftentimes um, they might resort to property theft. Um, but, you know, within a capitalistic society, there's a lot of emphasis on success, right? So um, this really is the underpinning of economic crimes um, that, you know, we are taught through our culture that, you know, how others see you or how you see yourself is really determined about how much money you have. Um, it's probably not the greatest characteristic, but you know, we look up to people with lots of money, even though sometimes maybe they got their money in unethical ways, right? There are a lot of jobs you can legitimately make a lot of money. Um, doesn't necessarily mean you're you're doing a great service to the community or anything like that. Um, so, you know, in understanding this, we know that the higher the level of deprivation, the more likely there is to be poverty. Um, and this provides the poor with a way of gaining, you know, something economically. Um, even things like auto theft, right? Um, certain automobiles uh, carry a status and symptom or status or status symbol. So um, maybe you might be likely to, you know, or tempted to steal one, um, you know, to gain that kind of status and things like that, or to steal money to buy one or whatever it is. So here we're going to talk about um, techniques of new, uh, neutralization. And so techniques of neutralization are just rationalizations, like why people decide to do this. So if you think about something like um, shoplifting, right, um, sometimes people will rationalize it to themselves and they go, oh, well, I've, you know, the store rips me off all the time or, um, you know, I shop here all the time, so I deserve a little something or whatever. Um, you know, even to the extent, I don't know if the, our, this version of the book talks about it, but the old version used to talk about, um, you know, how hotels have to like nail down like the lamps. They, I mean, they have to nail down everything because people are ripping them off. And it's kind of interesting, first of all, that people would want, you know, gross towels that have been used by everybody. Um, but get this, a third of hotel guests take towels, right? Um, First of all, gross. But at the, the, the same time, it's like, I think, um, like from a psychological level, the hotel, you kind of, you know, you have all of this access to things. No one's watching you or it's, you know, in your own private place or, you know, and again, they might rationalize that, well, this hotel was so expensive. I might as well take the pillows or whatever it is. I don't recommend that because, you know, they're just going to add it on, tack it on to your bill pretty much at this point. But towels usually can go unnoticed. Um so anyways, I don't know. <laughs> um, so other reasons why property crime occurs. So economic deprivation and unemployment. This is pretty repetitive of what we just talked about. But we also know things like unemployment really promotes social disorganization, right? You don't have that cohesiveness within communities and even um, the physical aspects of certain communities like broken windows um, might contribute to more crime in general. 
Lastly, you probably um, kind of, you know, we kind of talked about this, but routine activities theory. So certain people or certain activities put people more at risk. So if you're out vacationing all the time, um, you know, obviously that's going to make you more likely to be um, victimized. Um, but also social process factors. Um, you know, some, some criminals will commit property crime just for the thrill of it. Um, think about someone like... Um, Winona Ryder, if you don't know who she is, she was a really famous actress. I mean, really famous. She was like Hollywood's it girl. And then, gosh, it's been a long time now, maybe 15 years, but she got caught shoplifting. And you're like, what? Why are you shoplifting? You have more money than anyone. Why are you shoplifting? And it really kind of helps us understand that, you know, there's there's a thrill to it. There's a, you know, an exhilaration that comes with getting away with something. It can be really seductive for people. Um... And, of course, people desire goods regardless of their class. So, you know, those structural conditions um, can really, you know, um, influence that. So, again, just kind of touching on the thrill of it. Obviously, something like arson, um, unless you're doing it for revenge, but if you're just, like, starting fires just to start fires, you know, there's something very primitive about that, I think, you know, our obsession with fire. It goes back to when we used to really need fires. Um, but, you know, arson can be for the thrill of it. I like to watch fire get big, you know. I remember as a kid, my brother used to get hairspray and, like, a lighter and, you know, do this torch thing. He used to freak me out totally, but he liked playing with fire. I don't know. I don't know where my parents were. Um... So, you know, even with regards to arson, but arson can also be used to cover up crimes. Um, you know, oftentimes people will murder someone and then burn the house down thinking that they will destroy all the evidence. FYI, that doesn't work very well. You know, they know how to read into that. And then also, like, arson for profit, like we were talking about before. Um, we also might, when, when considering social process factors or, you know, how people come to acquire these types of attitudes, um, we know that things like larceny are very big among, and you know, all of these things, very big among adolescents. Um, think about that time in adolescence where, you know, your culture is telling you, you know, status, um, you want all of this stuff, you're seeing all of these things. But of course, you know, most of us at 15, 16, you know, even in your early 20s now, it, we don't have a lot of money. Um, and so you're getting these messages, have this, have this, have this, um, or you want this, but then, you know, you don't really have access to it. So... Um, that really helps us understand, like, shoplifting with adolescents, um, you know, and then also think about, I know malls aren't as popular as they used to be, but, you know, when I was a teenager, that was something that people, did, like, teenagers did. There was nothing else to do. You used to go to the mall, right? Well, that's kind of, it's a perfect place to, you know, set you up for larceny. So, um, you know, when it comes to combating a lot of this, um, technology is the best way to combat things like shoplifting. And most stores will have um, some kind of, like, internal um, you know, group that's working uh, shoplifting prevention or whatever you want to call it. But actually what's most um, influential is actually employee theft, right? And again, people will rationalize while they're doing this, my employer doesn't pay me enough. Or um, you could even do like time theft where people will sit on the clock longer than, which is very common, people will sit on the clock longer than they're supposed to, um, right? And so there are, you know, various strategies that people can use. Um, I know... Um, Gosh, I'm going to forget the name of it. But Walmart have this thing where um, it would actually, like, track. Um, they had, like, these little dots that would actually track. And it was it was supposed to help them, like, know when to, you know, when all the to toilet paper is gone, for instance, we need to order more or something like that. But it also helped. I want to say it's R-E-D. I don't know. Um, it would also help them track um, loss of, of property, right? So... So now let's talk about how people might work to do what's called target hardening, which make, you know, make it easier for um, or harder for people to um, commit property crime against them. Um, so you can have things like community prevention. Um, think about in certain neighborhoods, you have like gated, um, you know, gates in the front. Um, you can also have um, in some places, I know um, in Palm Springs, uh, my family had a vacation house and 
they, um, I mean, there was a person who was very strict about who was allowed to get in. It wasn't like one of those ones where you can sneak in. You actually, um, they would like call the house to make sure they were expecting you. Um, and a lot of that was because most of these were vacation homes, right? And even in that sense, I'm pretty sure that house was burglarized as well. So again, um, security cameras are another way to target hard. And, and now a lot of people have these. And you can watch, you know, people burglarizing your house from your desk at work, which has happened numerous times because, you know, you can, you can um, watch all of this stuff online. So you're sitting there going, oh, my gosh, someone's in my house, you know. And, and they, they catch all these funny things like, you know, people going into their fridge and eating their food and, and all kinds of weird things. Um, so other forms of target hardening, things like, you know, locks for your doors, stronger locks, um, better lighting, right? It's really important. Those automatic lights are, work really, really good. Alarms, um, even if you don't have an alarm, I, might, I know my dad was like, do you, want, do you want one of my alarm signs? Because that would work as a deterrent too. Obviously, the person inside doesn't know if this is legit or not. Um, other strategies, neighborhood watch, right? If you're going out of town, tell your, you know, if you trust your neighbors at least, tell them so that if they see anything suspicious, right? And the best thing you can do to keep this stuff, especially burglary from happening, is to be home, right? I always laugh, and it's a really corny, um, corny example, but if you remember the movie Home Alone, right? What does he do when all the burglars trying to get in, right? He sets up this this party where it looks like there's, you know, 30 people in the house. So I know, really, really awesome example, Miss Lawson. Anyways, one, we'll move on here. All right, so now we're gonna talk about different types of fraud, right? And remember that fraud is um, just really, um, uh, you know, you're trying to do something deceptive, whatever that may be. It can look look like so many different types of, of things, but you are, you know, trying to do something to decept, um, being deceptive. So the first one is identity theft. So this is where maybe you have um, uh, someone's social security number or their checking account number or whatever it is, um, and you, for instance, um, pretend that you are that person. Um, and identity theft is probably one of the worst things that could happen to a person because um, these criminals will go out and open up all of these accounts. And um, I know I had it, um, it happened to a friend of mine. He had all of his personal information stolen. He was traveling for some reason. So he had a social security number or a card, his passport. And he said, this is insane. I can't even, they're opening more accounts like before I can even, you know, shut this down. And of course, because he had none of this, information on him, um, it was hard for him to prove himself that he was who he was, right? Um, so really, really difficult. Um, tax fraud, right? So tax fraud can look and, you know, it can, it can manifest in a lot of different ways. Um, the most prevalent is tax evasion, where people, you know, end up you know, trying to evade paying taxes. Um, some people will, for instance, hide assets or they'll have you know, Swiss bank accounts or whatever. So they do all of this so they don't have to pay taxes, but this is a um, crime. If you remember Al Capone, they weren't able to get him on any of the major crimes that he did, but they did get him on tax evasion. Um, so other types of tax fraud, I mean, no one likes to pay taxes, but you know, if you're lying on your forms and things like that, and, and a lot of people do, right? Um, when it comes to like if you're self-employed or you're making tips, um, uh, maybe lying about you know the cost of your property or something like that. And so again, tax fraud can manifest itself in all different types of ways. Um, but you know, um, yeah, I mean it's, it is what it is. Next, we have insurance fraud, and um, insurance companies are really kind of on to this, and because about 10% of all claims are actually fraudulent. So if you, for instance, I knew someone who, this was not very ethical, but he was hit, he was in a car accident, hit, but his car had had damage prior to the accident, and he tried to say that that happened during the accident. He didn't end up getting in trouble, but his act was fraudulent. Um, the reason they were able to tell was because there was rust 
where the in, like the initial um, the other impacts had taken place and they go well this is old this isn't new so don't try that because they're they're very um, you know they're very savvy in, into knowing what people are up to another type of fraud is computer fraud again this will manifest itself in a million different ways um, perhaps you've received an email from um, a Nigerian prince right saying can you hold my money for me um, there have been people who there are all different types of scams um, so for instance um, someone would write you a check and then ask well, you know can you just send two hundred dollars of this back um, for whatever reason and then you find out it will look like the check went through and then the check doesn't actually go through and it bounces and then you are responsible um, for you know um, paying that um, so other types of computer or computer fraud um, Craigslist um, there's a lot of fraudulent stuff be really careful with the stuff they can make websites look exactly I, I think I was um, years ago there was a, um, I was kind of, it's called phishing, where they throw it out to a lot of people, and it had to do with eBay. I was looking into buying something kind of pricey. I think I was looking at cars on eBay. I know I didn't end up doing it, but um, uh, it was too good to be true. And again, you know, too good to be true. Believe it. Um, but um, God, they sent me this eBay like invoice thing, and it looked so professional, and it looked just like the something you would get from you know um, eBay so other types of stuff and this stuff oftentimes we you know everyday people do things like stealing music or videos that's you know it's it's a property crime it's it's a crime so you know um, even plagiarizing would be kind of put into um, com computer fraud um, and again that's stealing someone else's knowledge or information and again um, you know saying that it's yours um, and then again, um, as it relates to computer fraud, you have computer crime, um, which is where you get like hacking and um, you know people putting viruses on your computer or all kinds of things. And they'll they'll hack you and then you know they'll kind of um, do like a ransom. It's kind of interesting. I've seen a couple cases of stuff like that. So it's like, oh, if you want all your um, your pictures and your information back, you need to give us five hundred dollars within two days. Um, and a lot of people do, because can you imagine? I mean, I know for myself, if I lost everything on my computer, I would be pretty screwed. Um, it would be totally worth $500. Um, not that I would ever want to be a victim of that, but you know, it's it's these are important documents, you know, um, pictures of people's children, you know, all of these things that we keep on our computers now. All right, and then here is our last um, slide here, and there's not a lot I need to say about it. I just wanted you to see, you know, how much this ends up costing our society. So a total of about $400 billion a year, right? That is huge. Um, check fraud, uh, about $20 billion. Identity theft, about $53 billion. Um, you know, and with that, you know, pay attention to what's going on with your accounts. Don't let things go too long where you don't check them. That's, that's scary. Um, insurance fraud, about eh, 85 billion. Um, or here it's even more. I have 85 billion here, but I, I wouldn't get. I wouldn't be surprised if it was more. Um, and then tax fraud, people trying to evade taxes or not pay taxes in some way or form. Um, you have almost up to 300 billion dollars. Right? So, anyways, well. Um, I will see you next chapter when we do white collar crime, which will be our last chapter. All right. Take care.